So welcome back to our story of the Quarrymen and how the Quarrymen become the Beatles. So up to episode five, and this time we're looking at John's best friend, Pete Shotton. In a couple of rare interviews, the first one, uh, an audio interview with a close friend of John and Yoko, Elliot Mintz, and then a rare TV appearance, an interview that Pete gave when he brought out his book all about his time, obviously, with John as a friend. So look out for those. Pete wasn't a musician, as he will readily admit. He played washboard. And how we got out to the quarrymen, I'll tell you at the very, very end. But this is Pete talking about those early days, those early practices, just when the quarrymen were getting going. And, of course, a crucial part in formation of the Beatles on the day John met Paul. We used to play in my uh, back garden. We had an old bomb shelter made out of tin, you know, that had still been left there. It used to throw the junk and we cleared this out. We all used to crowd into this thing and play me on the washboard and Len on the bass and John on his guitar and whatnot. And a guy called Eric Griffiths who got a guitar too. And we all used to get in there and jam away thinking we were the greatest things on earth. The village used to have a fate once a year. And this used to consist of taking a pretty girl from the neighborhood and crowning a rose queen and having a um, side shows and all this kind of thing. And my mother managed, because my mother was very clever at managing things like this, to organize it so that we were the entertainment. Now, first of all, we played in the back of the lorry in, a, in the field, which is the scouts field at the back of the church. And then in the evening, we went over to play for a dance that they were putting on. We were playing at that time, mostly Lonnie Donegan stuff, you know. And as I say, we thought we were terrific. And a lot of people said that we were, especially our mothers and aunties. <laughs> and um, Ivan had come along um, and brought this friend along, who, see, who he told us he was bringing along, who who he said could play the guitar pretty well. So after we'd finished playing, we came down off the stage and Ivan introduced this kid to us and his, happen his name happened to be Paul McCartney, as we all know now. And we spent about 20 minutes talking to him. At first it was like very reserved because John was always a bit like withdrawn or a bit careful about meeting new people. He used to like to suss them out. He he'd never, he'd never make the first move. People always had to come to him at first. And eventually Paul, like came to him by getting his guitar out. Paul, being the extrovert, broke the kind of awkwardness by getting his guitar out and playing, I think it was 20 Flight Rock. And John was obviously impressed by this, so we had a bit of a chat for a while, and as I say, about 20 minutes later, we all split up, and John and I were walking home together, and John said to me, um, what do you think of him, then, of Paul? And I said, uh, I think he's OK, I like him. And he said, well, should we ask him to join the band, then? And I said, yeah, it's OK by me if it's OK by him. And so that was that. We went home, <clears throat> didn't see Paul again for a while, and I was just so happened I was the next person to see him. I'd come out of my house, he was riding past my house on his bike, he jumped off his bike just to start chatting. We chatted a bit past the time of day, and then it suddenly occurred to me that we decided to have him in the... We had decided to have him in the band. Wow, lucky guy. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, oh, by the way, Paul, do you want to join the band? And he thought for a minute, very casually, and he said, uh, okay then, and jumped on his bike and rode off. How did it actually come down to the final group? I mean, how, how did that really occur? Uh, it was a slow process. We were introduced to George through Paul, um, who was only a little kid. He was like two years younger than we were, three years, years younger than John. So you can imagine when you're about 15 or 16 years of age, uh, a kid of 13 is like the little kids that you don't play with normally. Of course. But George was very good. He could actually pick tunes out on his guitar. We went out to his house and he played raunchy for us, which impressed us enormously. Because none of us could pick the guitars. Uh, so he gradually came into the group. He didn't come in initially because, as I say, he was a little kid. We didn't really want him around too much. Um, but he hung around and he came in. And then they had one or two drummers and eventually uh, Pete Best became the drummer. Um, didn't fit in for one reason or another uh, and was changed for Ringo. Uh, a great shame for Pete Best because he'd been through all the hard years and, you know, sure. as soon as they hit it, virtually hit it, um, he was changed for Ringo. Now, when the group was really established, how old were you know, the main age of the, the entire group of boys? When they were first established? Yeah. Well, I mean, you were talking about the fact yeah. you were 15. That's when right. you were really playing and starting to hit it in England, you were what? Well, I wasn't. I left the group soon after I left school when I was 16. Ah, right? ah. 
Um, but they started to hit it when they were, they were about 22, about 1962. So there was a real transition. Oh, I mean, sure. They really evolved and yeah. shaped they went things. Through, so. I mean, most people think it was Cliff and there's the Beatles, you know, but I mean, they went through six years of very hard grind and, and some very difficult times mm -hmm. uh, before they eventually made it. Now, how did they make it over to the U.S.? I mean, that's kind of startling that a British group could start to hit the charts here. Well, it, was, it was virtually unknown, actually. I, just, I spent a night with... With John, we used to uh, get together and like stay up the whole night and just chat the night away, you know. And it, it Brian had been trying to get into the states, uh, introduce records to Brian. to yeah, Brian Epstein right. had been trying to introduce records to America, and they knew there was no real reaction. But John all night was saying to me, "If I can get America piece, it's the doorway to the world. If I can get into America, I've got the world." You know, I mean, mm -hmm. that's how aware he was. And there weren't too many people who thought there was any possibility. Uh, least possibility that any uh, recording star from, from England could break into the States. But of course they did it. That's right, they did it. I actually, very strangely, I took the phone call from Ed Sullivan, which um, which started it all off. I, I'd gone up to Brian Epstein's office to see him about some business. John That's Blaney, the manager. Some money. That's right, Brian mm -hmm. Epstein. Um, and I'd gone up there to, to see him about uh, arranging some money that John was lending me to get started in business. And he was out of the office and the phone rang and it rang and it rang. I thought, well, I might as well answer. And I picked it up. And it was Ed Sullivan's office. They wanted yeah, Brian nice. Epstein. I took the message down, put the phone down. When Brian returned to the office, we just chit chatted, you know, talked and did the business thing. You and then I said, by oh, the way, the way, yeah. so called Ed, uh, Ed uh, Sullivan, I think it is. And he went through the room for course. That's yeah. incredible. So there's two fascinating interviews with Pete Shotton. How did Pete get out of the quarryman? Well, he was John's best friend. Didn't want to tell John he wanted to quit. John didn't really want to sack his best mate, Pete. And so they were playing at a wedding reception. Colin Hansen had disappeared, so Pete sat behind the drums briefly. And then he'd had a jar or so. And Pete plugs up the courage and says, John, I don't want to do this anymore. And John picks up Pete's washboard and goes, clunk. Right over Pete's head. And Pete sat there with the frame round his neck. The metal bit has popped out. Well, that deals with that then, doesn't it? That was Pete out of the quarryman. John always had the last word. Don't forget to tune in next time for more in how the quarrymen become the Beatles. <laughs>